Testing, testing, testing. Good evening. <clears throat> I was going to use the joke about cutting my head off, but I already covered that. Everybody saw my headshot. I'm going to abuse Andre for a while for that one. But welcome. So obviously, I'm called in to do the What's New in Autodesk Revit this time in 2019. Sorry I missed you all last year. Won't happen again if he allows me to come back next year. Um, as you are going to find out, there's a lot of content available for what's new. So if you uh, want to learn more about some of the topics I show, I'm going to provide some links. Andre, we typically provide this presentation too, right? Yeah. So I'll provide the yeah, presentation. The presentation is <clears throat> it's chock full of links, um, good resources and things that you could find out about it. Focusing on a few interesting topics. So this is a basically what we're going to be discussing about today. Uh, talking about things that Autodesk has incorporated into the new release of Revit 2019. Um, but as I mentioned, things like this, you know, links to all kinds of good stuff about the new features. For instance, bring you right to the help documentation and a whole bunch of videos on some of the topics that we'll be covering. So let's get into it. As I did last year before I got into what's new in 2019, I like to summarize what was available or what was updated since 2018. Because as you all know, there's a few hot fixes, a few patches, and a few things since the out of the box 2018 came out. So that was about, you know, March, right? The whole the whole tool 2018 was released and they were busy throughout the year updating things and incorporating components. And I was actually going to elaborate on some of these, but guess what? You can click here, Roger. And another link will bring you to a real nice summary of all the features that have been incorporated since the 2018 release. Um, but as I'll go over the 2018 and over the 2019 enhancements, you'll see that they kind of indicate some cool, um, you know, where, where did we get this idea? Where did we get this, this tool to update the, the tool. So there's an ideas form. Um, I think it's literally Revit ideas. You'll show that, I'll, I'll bring that up as well. Oh, that was, that was it, ideas form, but it's, it's Revit ideas. So you can go to Revit ideas at any time and submit an idea. And the more ideas that people vote on and say that's a really good idea, it'll be incorporated into the tool. And as you could see, this was the most requested feature that was accepted and incorporated into the new release or filters, and we'll get into that. So anyway, you'll have this presentation, you'll have these links, and we'll discuss all of these cool features. I was gonna make the, the trying to make the font bigger, but I think that's pretty good. There's a lot going on there. <clears throat> but before I get into that, this is kind of like a repeating theme, but wait, before we get started in 2019, did you guys know that Revit can do site work? Nobody, one person, Stephanie. New St Stephanie, is this your first visit to the Revit user group? Yeah. Oh, really? We've just been crossing paths. Nice to see you. But Stephanie's the only one who knew that there are some tools within Revit that's, I mean, this is actually, I believe it came out in 2016, but they've been incorporating it and actually making it a really interesting tool, being able to do all kinds of cool things to the kind of bland topography that we can make in Revit. Anyway. By the way, I expect some sort of interaction, even though people uh, people in the on the web. George, hello, by the way. Sorry to hear that uh, you couldn't make it to the meeting. I think you're here every time. Everybody say hello to George. So this is just, I thought it was super cool. And as I was going through some of the features, there are some enhancements to the site designer, but you really should check it out. Again, there's gonna be links to videos about describing these tools. So I think people really should know that it's a, it's out there, it's available. So now we're gonna start the 2019 features. Categorized by modernize first. This I thought was really cool until I started using it. <laughs> but no, it is, it is still really cool, but it's a little awkward. You'll get used to it. Meaning that we're gonna be able to um, have all of your views visible in, this, in the scene or in the working space, be able to close views by clicking the different tabs, 
be able to drag tabs out of this docked position and actually move them off. So tiling is easier now. I can tile in different features rather than just the default tile. As you can see, I could kind of drag views. Oh wait, aren't I supposed to have Revit open? All right, hold on, let me just open Revit. Oh, I do have Revit open. So let me show you. Oh, that was a pretty decent rendering, isn't it? I just did that within like 10 minutes. It was a high resolution rendering. Actually, I think it's still working. But here's an example of things that are capable. Why is it blinking? You guys seeing that as well? Huh, all right, now it's not blinking. But basically you could see that, that I could pull views, pull tabs off of a, of a docked position. I can move them around. I could tile them in different spots. I can even take this thing and put it on my other monitor. Why is it blinking like this? All right, let's close this. So see how I'm completely maximized within the monitor? That's pretty cool. No? All right. So you could still dock it within the working space, or you could rip it off and put it into another monitor. So as you open up new views, you'll see that these new views can be tiled as well. So you could tile the views as we typically are used to doing, or we can throw them into a tabbed view, a tabbed working space. I think it's pretty cool. And I apologize if I say that too many times. Isn't that cool? But I, I think it's cool. I think you should say it's cool. It's cool. No, those are good. I, I encourage oohs and ahs or, oh, that, that's nice. Or, you know, just even some nodding would help. So it's tough when you're doing the web, the webinar, the presentation online, you can't see anybody. So, so I'm gonna force you guys to interact. And if I, you know, maybe I'll pick on Stephanie since she's, you know, loudly crunching potato chips during my presentation. No, no, <laughs> you can't hear it. <laughs> I didn't mean you had to stop it. So very cool. Like if I was working in a rendering, for instance, or a, you know, a camera view and model up modifying stuff, you know, within the model, I could drag that thing onto the other monitor and do a full screen, a full bleed. You don't even see a tab at all, which is kind of neat. Well, you do, you see a little thing. Yeah, Stephanie, you can ask a question. Yes, that's why I'm interacting. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Well, when you said ribbon is gonna change, you're, I can't illustrate that, but, so I could pull the thing off, right? And I could take this and maximize it within the, the space. What was the question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, right, right, right. The, the, the ribbon, right, and the ribbon tools and tabs are active within the session. So as I move from different views, that ribbon will show, like for instance, I grab something in the model, like a this this flickering is going to bother the heck out of me. I'm going to have to close it in a session. All right. So when I select this, I'd have to look over here to see the the what do they call the context sensitive tools that are related to to roofs. So let me close this. Go back to the presentation because it's going to bug the heck out of me. And then I'll start it up over there while I'm doing this. Okay. Super cool. I did answer your question, right, about the way that it works. Um, I was, you know, I there's tab views and tile views. You'll see that they'll kind of get in the way a little bit sometimes. So as I'm as I'm working through and I'm moving these views around, you could still dock the tabbed views and they show up like tab 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 tab. And even if I say close hidden hidden windows, which we do frequently, those will all go except for the primary one. But that floating one is still over there, which is I don't know. It's, it's neat. It's neat. I know somebody <clears throat> happens to have four monitors. <clears throat> I don't understand. They're four high K monitors. You two? Four high K monitors with like crazy graphic cards. Having any problems? Anymore? No, five. All right, good. Five? All right, never mind. Still here. How about this? Being able to actually select and view 3D levels, levels in 3D. Let me show you that. No, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's still interacting. That's interacting. No, I agree. 
it is a it is it doesn't happen in all views for like for instance if you're in a i don't know here it goes let's imagine it's not blinking anymore so something to do with the projection are you seeing the blink as well it's not blinking online oh, great <laughs> so these levels are not visible by default so you have to go into visibility graphics and into annotation and into levels to find levels and turn them on. Obviously, levels would not be uh, an opportunity in a 3D view prior to 2019, but that's pretty cool. So now we're going to have the opportunity of moving and screwing up our model in any view. And get this, if I delete that level, not only will you get a nice little message, but if I expand it, I get a lot of information on what would happen if I deleted this level, which is about time, right? It, it wasn't telling us all of this, but this is everything that will be messed up if I delete that level, which is kind of cool. But the default is cancel, which is not, which is good because if I hit enter or whatever, right, that would be bad if I said, okay. Speaking of okay, you get those messages where you're attached a wall to a, to a roof and when you move that wall, Revit yells at you and says, these things are still attached, but they no longer connect. Okay? Ooh, why, why would okay? That's not a good, oh, not okay. All right, anyway, this is the kind of show that you expect when you invite me to do the Revit user group meeting. No, it's, it's fine if your Autodesk is here too. Keith Hughes always gets a kick out of me. So that's kind of neat. Yes, you can move, you can modify, you can delete levels. Um, they get displayed almost anywhere. So even if we do some cool cropping of views, you know, like you have that cool selection crop thingamajiggy, this guy. Like if I grab that and I do this, everybody knows this selection box. Bang. That's kind of cool. And did I turn off levels? No, they're there. How neat is that? And it flips around as, as to make sure it's visible. That's neat. Of course, I hate seeing all of the scope boxes, but we'll get into scope boxes in a minute. I think I screwed up my model. Where are the walls? All right, anyway. <clears throat> materials. Another one of those about time. You know, these materials are are <laughs> that material library that we've seen in Revit has really not changed in 10 years. You know, sure, they shared them with 3D Studio Max or what have you, but now we have a new physically based appearance materials. So that means that the materials are, um, you know, accurate. It's, it, these images aren't great, and I know they're small on the screen, but you just got to play with them. They really are really nice. And to illustrate that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply open up the uh, materials dialog box to give you an idea, how do I know when it's new, right? So the old materials have this little symbol on it and the new materials do not. So for instance, there's a, you know, there's a new acoustic tile, ceiling tile. Why does it, is it new? Maybe this wasn't the perfect example, but you know, it's, it's got some cool properties to it and one can continue to use those assets to make new materials that are physically based, meaning that this asset is really controlling the, uh, you know, the parameters of the material and how those parameters help make things look realistic. So that's a, like a bamboo. That's kind of neat too. The fabrics are really nice, the leathers, the, you know, the carpet. So, oh, <laughs> the classic one is the, um, the classic, uh, material that I've always wanted to see go, you know, be fixed is the, the grass on the site, you know? So, you know, you, if you render that, it doesn't look much better than what you see here. Uh, what's a good view that has that? So the courtyard. So if I was to render a slice, a slice of that, I think I'll just turn it on to a realistic view. I probably should have prepared for this presentation as far as what happens when I render and switch the grass. But I think you guys have all seen that, right? The grass kind of looks kind of cheesy. And I don't know if you notice, as I'm navigating around, things are changing. It's not a typical navigation. That'll be another topic. Let me get there. 
I mean, we all do rendering, right? In using the Revit materials. How many people are creating, you know, really complex or advanced or office-based material libraries? Yeah, we just kind of taken it and then give it to the renderer to do whatever. He or she does it in Max probably anyway. All right, anyway, they're better and getting very similar to what's happening in Max. I know I keep going back and forth. Materials, by the way, if you guys haven't tried V-Ray for Revit, you gotta give it a shot. Well, is that all right? Full plug. <laughs> content, they've improved and added a lot of content. So if you haven't noticed, there's hundreds of new content. A lot of it is, um, is furniture and systems based, like, like workspaces and work desks and casework and cabinetry and a lot of good stuff. I think there are hundreds of new um, libraries that are available in the default out of the box library installation. So maybe not a good time to, <laughs> now I'm sure there's still stuff that they need. You have this, this is a big thing. I, did, I had to find out why. This is the uh, Dash chair, or how do you say that in German? Doc. Doc. So they, Autodesk did a, a little partnership with some, uh, some uh, I think it was Africa developing group and teaching people how to design and do th things. And essentially what they did is they took this, this chair that they made and they laser cut and whatever and prefabricated. And so now that's there too, so if you need that. And actually, some, some furniture and stuff is cross-compatible with Fusion, which is a new feature, I think. Okay. As I was mentioning when we we're in some of these camera views, you can now switch between orthographic and projection, or perspective, I'm sorry, orthographic and perspective, in any view at any time, which is kind of neat. So if I'm in one of my views, right, like if I go here and I wanted to switch it to the orthographic, why would I want to do that? No, but if I wanted to um, uncrop it, I can actually go and interact with this, this camera view quite easily. But as you see, when I'm navigating through camera views and I'm doing things like look or down or, or, or pan, right? I'm actually moving the camera, which is kind of neat if you're into that kind of thing. So camera views and the navigation, the ability to move around cameras and perspective views are kind of neat. You're also able to do a lot more editing that you were never able to do before. So for instance, I can kind of place components anywhere. I can place furniture. I could do all kinds of, of actual edits, except when the view is, has those elements turned off. <laughs> but you can do a lot more editing, and there are a lot more you know, interactive kind of controls that we're used to in other views, even though I'm in a perspective view. All right, that doesn't excite anybody. I got to get back to some of the good ones. So not only can I right click on the view cube, but I can also do that change in the properties of the 3D or camera view. I thought this was super cool. So I created a new slide just completely for this. And do we have any structural engineers in the house? Oh man. So this whole thing is gonna be like, yeah, I don't care. But this is quote unquote, a, a, an Autodesk slogan, <laughs> a notable step towards the future of automatically making structural things because you know, I'm surprised no structural engineers here. We usually have a couple. Anyway, there are links to that if you wanted to learn more about it. Really kind of impressive stuff. Um, if anybody's kind of venturing into prefabrication, this is a tool that you want to know about. Anybody prefab? No? Why not? All right, we won't do that. And look, I copied the slide with the wrong slogan underneath. So I copied the slide and put the structural stuff and left that. All right, anyway. Would anybody have noticed that if I had not pointed it out? Okay, scope box. When you guys are in, in Revit and you guys are modifying, does everybody do, you know, I showed you that thing where you kind of select something in a view. Actually, even if I'm in a, even if I'm in a, a 3D view or camera view, you know when you did this thing, this whole idea of section box, a selection box, you take a selection and get a cropped view out of it. I was doing that all the time by right clicking on the cube. Does anybody, everybody know this, this tool, oriented view? All right, not everybody, but a few. Oriented view. So I take a 3D view and I orient it to another view like a section, all right? 
So it takes the entire view extents, the 3D extents of that section, and creates a 3D view out of it, which is which is kind of cool, right? But the thing is, if I'm in that view and I go back and modify the section, that's not going to modify the view, right? So if I said <coughs> orient to view and said orient to a section, I want a view that's got the same extents as a section. If I modify the section, it does not orient this view. It doesn't change the view. They're not linked at all. I have to redo this, orient to view, go through that section, right? Now, if we wanted, which is kind of cool, I can actually say I want a 3D view, but I want it cropped by a scope box. So I have a few scope boxes that I've already created. Does everybody know what a scope box is? Typically, people use them to, to make all their floor plans the same exact size, but they're also intended to uh, filter out datums that are not applicable to this view. For instance, if I had Tower A and Tower B, and I wanted to look in an elevation of Tower A, I don't want to see the datums for Tower B, or a theater, front of house, back of house, I want to isolate them. That's the, un, the not popular part about scope boxes. And does anybody have a project that has 20 to 30 scope boxes. Why? Why? That that drives me nuts. I don't understand it. How many different size floor plans could you possibly have in your project that you need to have locked with a scope box? You have an unusual shape building. All right, I'm not really judging. <laughs> All right, we can all vent and kind of have a, like a little th uh, therapeutic session. But this is kind of cool. So here I am in a 3D view, and now you'll find, now you find a property that says scope box. All right, and anything happens to that scope box anywhere, it's going to update this 3D view. I don't know, I thought it was pretty cool. No, not cool? Oh, that's one of those about time ones. <laughs> I'm a little nervous, like, you know, Rod, stop talking about it. It's a crappy feature or no, it is a good feature. Ooh and ah. I don't know. I thought it was I thought it was kind of neat. But it updates. And I don't think I need to uh, to show you how it updates. All right. Next feature. Oh, what else? Oh, but it's also alphabetic, uh, numerically alphabetically organized. That's good. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Can you believe? I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. Previously, it was ordered ordered by the time of creation, meaning whoever created it first. <laughs> Why? <laughs> all right, I'm glad we're all in agreement. But hey, that's one good thing. At least we got that going for us. Okay. Ooh, strengthen. And about time, Andre was basically like jumping up and down when he when he read this. And what I actually what I actually wanted to know is what is it about the OR filter that you guys really needed to have? Like what what filters? In this example. Just turning off elements that are not visible or not needed in this view, but you can't restrict the view to that. Yes. In this example, they're coloring um, rated walls because somebody has, you know, one hour or one HR or one or two hour or the word, the letter TWO hour, right? <laughs> it's almost as bad as you know, the layer naming conventions we had in AutoKit. All right, so that's good. So we can go and nest them as well. So we can get quite complicated and quite confusing. But you guys are incorporating this, these type of filters into your templates and populating them out project-wide. Did you already start doing it? You haven't migrated to? I haven't, I haven't upgraded yet. But that's usually what I ask. This particular one is the Are people now? 
Revit ideas. It's on there. Yeah, I know it's, it's on, on there. <laughs> hey, now we can des define complex and sophisticated Thanks. rules. Anybody else have one? I mean, I think Stephanie in the MEP world, there's tons of filters, visualizing systems, and right. What else? Ah. Anybody else have a good use of filters where or would be no? All right. <laughs> I am. I'm. Kind of, I was kind of hesitant about this one. Andre, is this one of those about time? Double fill patterns. Now it makes your dialogue twice as big, more things to go through, but that's yeah, still okay. And who would create this one? Finally, finally I don't have to tell my, my principles, no, I cannot do that, that edge pattern unless you find me a tool for making edge pattern or I spend 25 hours opening <laughs> line type number. You don't do that, do you? So this is, this is good in surface, it's in cut. All right, so you're not only going to be able to do it in a in a surface pattern, but also a cut pattern, which is kind of cool. All right. This one, <laughs> I had a lot of fun demoing this one. All right, let's just let's just read it together, right? So vertical text alignment improvements, horizontal and vertical alignment options. What do you think that means? Because it probably doesn't mean what you thought it means. Anyway, let me let me illustrate. So I'm going to go to a sheet. I could see my sheets. Why don't I make this smaller? Oh. Oh, good. This is where I did it. So I took a bunch of text. By the way, if you're interested, you can actually see what the Revit roadmap is up to and what they plan on implementing and including in future updates. <laughs> so each piece of text has a different alignment option. Right? So this piece of text is top justified, this piece of text is middle justified, and this piece of text is bottom justified. So th this is the feature. I'm aligning this piece of text to the bottom of another object. I'm aligning this piece of text easily updates. Oh, look, look, it's not updating to that because that's set to align to the middle. I don't know. Does anybody care about that? <coughs> Isn't that weird? So this one has a middle justification option, and it will align with things via its middle. The moment you have like three pieces of text, like in your in the detail on the left there, right? Mm -hmm. If you add some some more either on a floor plan, you have some annotations floating around somewhere. Each new tag or piece of text that you try to arrange is finding. Well, different things to align to none of them. <laughs> okay, so this is going to be good in your application. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just make a default for all pieces of text? Should all be top justified or something? No, it's, 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 the, it's the nature of the user. It's, it's a functionality that has great potential, but it's also annoying. Yeah. Okay. So I like. Getting feedback because I'm I'm curious. This is a new feature, but how is it going to be implemented? How are people going to use it? <clears throat> You're going to love this one. <laughs> can you believe that? What year is this? How long has Revit been out? Now I can actually rename a view without opening another dialog box. Let me demo that. So here's my project browser. And I can actually say, yeah, let me just rename the whole level who. This is a new feature. Don't ask me this again. Yeah, but wouldn't you always want the levels to be named one thing and your floor plans to be named something else? Maybe you have a consistent list of one view per level that's out of the box consistent and then the other ones are going to be renamed whatever they're going to be renamed all right anyway is this nice to have this 
you'd have to go into your Revit I and I in order to fix that or ask that to be uh, prompted again. That's a good question. I have two. Yes, it does. <laughs> See, this is exactly why I like to do these things. Nice. I actually also wanted to do something else. I don't know if anybody noticed what was going on there, but I'm just going to let that go. All right, so that's kind of cool to be able to, you know, quickly click, rename without having to open another dialog box. And thank you, Jason. F2. Did anybody know that? Where where, where have I been? It almost it almost like that that flag E I was so excited about ten years ago. I didn't know that. That's brand new. I love that. I'm going to put that into the presentation. Everybody at home got that? You click on a view, you hit F2, and you automatically rename. Wow. How about how about the the minus sign and the plus sign will collapse and expand all your that's kind of cool. Yes, it's true. Thank you, Audit Desk. <laughs> I already showed the warning when you delete levels, right? Suppress the dialog box when you rename views. I think it probably should be no, no, right? We want to leave our levels the name and we want to rename our views. All right, anyway. This is kind of neat. I almost want to just run and open a file just to show you that. So as you do file open, you click on an RVT, it's going to show you the view, uh, the version of that, that RVT. About time. <laughs> I'm going to make a new section or or maybe even just a, a key when it's about time. It goes, woo, 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 about time. Yes. I don't know. I mean, I think you're still a sin. What is it saving? A few seconds. I click it. It starts to load. And then it tells me you want to upgrade this file, doesn't it? Or no, it starts upgrading the file, doesn't it? It starts upgrading in the channel. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this is nice. This is nice. I thought there was a couple of years. I thought there was a couple of years that it actually said, "Would you like to upgrade this file?" Yeah. Anyway. All right. Well, I don't need to display that. Well, I could, right? File open. Look at my look at my my documents folder. That's kind of cool. This is kind of neat. Um, demoing it is kind of, you know, it's not really explaining a lot, but the whole idea is we're able to quickly dimension curved objects. And the caveat is in section views. <laughs> Let me show you. So I have a ceiling plan view that I wanted to turn on everything because there was some structural stuff that I kind of wanted to see. Right? And I want to create a section. It'd be nice if I could snap to midpoint, but so here's a section. And that section's going through everything in this area. When I open up that view, my tree is in the way. But I'm actually going to be able to annotate this element and snap to an element that's here in section. Did it work? That's pretty neat. It's like it's got it's got a section plane that cuts an element that allows me to select that elements piece. How? I don't know. Right? So I mean, what are we looking at? I'm looking at a view that cuts this element here. I'm tagging here. I don't know. It was a little difficult for me to figure out a good way of demoing that. And what I did is I went and plan and measured it as well, and it's that measurement. But it's not along the curve. 
Anyway. Hey. It's an end-to-end -end workflow for bridges. Yes, move on. How about this one? Yeah. Yes, you can use the split tool, one of my favorite tools of all Revit, because it's got that exacto blade icon. Everybody knows which one. Never have to change the blade. Never cut yourself. How many people in this in this audience here has a a scar from cutting chipboard or yeah? So six. Let's do a railing demo. Um, actually, I have a railing file right there, and I did know it was upgraded already, or needed to be upgraded. That was part of my presentation was to show the file version and go and do it anyway. But all right, so this file is pretty cool. I've been using this one for a while. Anybody else noticing things are just falling away here? There it is. All right, check out this file. It's pretty cool. So just an example I use in class, all the different kinds of railings. Don't judge my railings. Modify, split. There's the cool thing. I'm going to split with delete inner segment. It works both ways, but that's kind of neat. So let's see if we could break it. Huh? Huh? So without delete, delete inner segment, it's just going to basically create a piece. And as you can see, these railings are created with unique balusters to start in the beginning. Same thing over here, meaning it always puts a post at the beginning. So what we're doing is by, by splitting the railing, we're ending up with a, a, an individual sketch, a brand new sketch. We should have grading cards. People could raise flags. Like, oh, that new feature is a two. <laughs> I wasn't really impressed with this one because how hard is it, right, to take it and copy it and edit it? All right. Somebody had that idea. Jason's uh, sneaking out. Everybody say goodbye, Jason. <laughs> Somebody's going to get me back one of these days. So, there, yeah. Oh. So, like I mentioned, there was a lot of cool structural related features. So because there aren't very many structural people in the room, I'm not going to go into too many details. But, you know, more and more um, features related to structure are being implemented in Revit, right? So we had structure from day two, I think. So it was hidden within Revit architecture when it was first created. And then they realized that, hey, let's release it. Did you know that? So they turned to switch and now all of a sudden we have structural tools. But it was there all along. Now the structural tools are really kind of, you know, catching up with other industry applications. I won't mention, <clears throat> but you can go in there and create some really cool plates and bolts and angles and welds. And I was playing around with it. It's pretty easy to do. It wasn't hard to do in the past, but now there's more content, and there's more features, and more interactive pieces. So pretty impressive. And you have some other um, functionality between the other applications like advanced deal and um, and IFC in general. We're going to talk about IFC in a minute. But these things act like parts. Now, I was curious, how many people use parts in Revit? No? You're not using parts, not taking a, a wall and breaking it down into individual components and then bending them back or, yeah, I don't know either. But they're very useful. They're almost like, you know, dynamic blocks on steroids. So this idea is you're going to be able to create all all these cool connections and build them into parts so that I can add or remove or nest parts. So all of these cool pieces can be combined or even drawn separately. It's it's very neat. So if you're interested in taking a, uh, a Revit class, Revit structure class, I have a Revit structure class coming up next month. And we'll be digging deep into some of these cool tools. The annotation is easy to do because dimensioning just automatically finds the correct elements and then you could switch you know to be overall or incremental uh, dimensioning pieces they're all showing overall right now but anyway you know you could see that they would show the difference uh, separation or the the distance between each center line of both or the overall dimension so it's good stuff and now they're all schedulable because they're all in intelligent components uh, built in I'm actually curious and there weren't any structural people in the room but you know What's what's stopping you from building all of this stuff into your your Revit project? I mean, I know um, you can do a lot of uh, rebar and a lot of you know new connections now. Is that going to make 
their models even bigger and heavier. Yeah. No, nobody's going to do that. No. What's 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 nice is that when you create all this rebar, you can configure it and say, I don't want this rebar to show up in any other view except this view and this view. So you really get to control it a lot. Or I could turn it on any time I need to see it. It's almost like you have a work set of rebar and it's turned off automatically by default. So I don't think there's any really reason why they shouldn't be doing it. Because unless the view is seeing the element, you're not really processing a lot of that. You know, it's not taking up a lot of resources. Yeah, no, you don't see rebar by default. I don't, I, it's a be a good discussion. That's a curious, I'm curious. To model more. Yeah. Yeah. We all know that's the. Yeah. No, and I don't think they. I don't think they will. I'm ready to argue that I don't think it will, because the the data about yeah no the data about this at these elements, are there right? It's only you know textual information. It's not really stressing out the model until you regenerate that information. So if all this rebar is not visible in my model, because my model, my views are set to look architectural, and they're not visible in the structural models unless, you know, the structural views unless indicated to be visible, I don't think it'll really stress it out. But what's interesting is that rebar by default will be single line rebar until you ask it to show full representation. So you're not going to see it that often. Anyway, good discussion to have. So where are we having drinks today, Andre? That should be a slide next time. <laughs> These are our options. All right, I know more, more, more stuff about structural. But again, I think it's really kind of useful. And the more we lean towards a prefabricated model, the more useful these things are going to be. All right, so some really cool videos online about how you can take a floor slab and then just say segment it based on the properties that are defined in the structural, uh, in the precast, uh, you know, menus. And then it can be exported in, you know, driving machines and informing logistics. And anybody know what PXML is? You know, neither do I. But <laughs> for, those, for those firms that are doing um, prefabrication and, and driving machines to make this kind of stuff, it's very, very cool. There's a great little video on this, but I'm not going to open it because, you know, if we're not really into doing prefabrication and we're not structural, I think it's uh, it's a little null point, but it's still pretty cool. So it's one of these tools that they're pushing out, and a lot of these, you know, this type of tool is based on a subscription. So if you have a subscription to the product, the desktop app is going to make that available to you. Andre, are you, are you allowing people to have access to the desktop app? Because I know some firms just kind of shut it down. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we have not disabled it, but we haven't explained it to anybody, and so nobody mm -hmm. uses it. Most people are just like, oh, it's there. I don't know what it is, so I stay away. Well, uh, I'm, I'm. One guy who actually upgraded when he shouldn't have. <laughs> that's classic. That's that's definitely could be a problem. When you're collaborating a lot with other architects and you're working with multiple architects on the same file. Mm -hmm. So if you have one person upgrades to yeah. you know, 18.3 and the other, the rest of the project is on 18.2, not good. Uh, you, have, you have a problem. So we need to manage our upgrading corporate wide. Yeah, I mean, those, uh, those options are still there, even if they do have access to this tool. So that might be another discussion, you know, account related permissions and allocation to downloads and support cases and things like that. But once you have the desktop app and you're signed in, that means that if any product is assigned to you or any permission or every, any resource or any uh, cloud-based tool, you're going to have access to it here. 
So yeah, you could download stuff, but you know, you still have access to updates, you have access to the products that you're assigned to. And you know, some of these tools like the, you know, the structural precast <coughs> extension, that's where you'll find it. So anyway, there's that. Speaking of data, right? So we were talking about how this information can be exported out. IFC is probably the, one of the most common, you know, neutral formats that the industry has been using. So Autodesk has upgraded to IFC 4 as of this release of 2019. Um, fantastic improvements if you're, you know, in that world of sharing models with, you know, people not using Revit, or if you're competing in competitions where there are, you know, international competitions and they kind of want a neutral BIM file. This is the file for you. Anybody use an IFC? All right. So <laughs> the next step would be, I want to introduce this thing. It's the Sol Solibri IFC optimizer, just because, and I won't spend too much time on it, but Solibri is, is you know, a tool that's not Autodesk, um, but it's a, you know, a clash uh, code generating application, but it has a cool optimizer that's free. So there's, it's a very cool tool if you're bringing your models um, or exporting your models to IFC and importing, exporting. So if you're messing around with it, you'll notice the files start to get ridiculously huge. Bang, there's your solution, free of charge. <clears throat> Talking about importing and exporting, gotta love Rhino, right? Everybody uses Rhino, most people use Rhino. Now I can import and link Rhino files. Caveat, you can link SAT, and you could currently right now only import the actual 3DM, the Rhino file. So they haven't upgraded or haven't figured out the Rhino 6 version because it really just got published recently. But um, one can, um, can bring in Rhino models, which is still pretty cool. And I didn't know that they couldn't be copied or mirrored. <laughs> but I guess that's what we're learning here. But now they can. Anyway, that's not one of these cool, cool, uh, no? Bringing Rhino models into your project? So like I did a, I did a, a pretty, <laughs> I did a, uh, an advanced uh, class for Pelly Clark, Pelly Architects. So they use Rhino all the time. I mean, Vignola uses Rhino probably uh, mainly for conceptual form finding, right? So being able to, to bring in a, a Rhino model and be able to do, cut floor plates and to do wall by face, it's fantastic. So you don't have to take an, uh, you know, an SAT and put it into a Revit family and, so all of these direct Rhino imports are working really, really well. No, oh, they're, they're, yeah, no, they work really well. Uh, the, 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 my recommendations are always make them like solid, unified, closed poly surfaces, not you know a bunch of like SketchUp faces. Anybody use SketchUp? All right, never mind. I really don't want to know. That's one of my. I, I have a problem with SketchUp. It's like working with crayons or something. I'd be I'd be more than happy to, more than happy to. I have like one of those, you know, like beat Bobby Flay kind of things. You try and and beat me in building something in Rhino versus SketchUp. I absolutely can blow you away every time. But you can't say I can't. You know, don't use Rhino. <laughs> they. If people, there's no way that you're going to take away Rhino from the office. SketchUp, we can do without. That's my opinion. Everybody back there agree? SketchUp fans in the room? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, there are some options out there. Though. It's sketches. It's like creating, like you're using crayons. But being on the 3D printing side as well, those models are just brutal sometimes, you know? People, a lot of people don't really know how to make a nice clean SketchUp model, you know? They don't know how to close them, they don't know how to, it's just pushing and pulling and cutting faces and, yeah, so sometimes it can be brutal. I've, I've very rarely been able to bring in a SketchUp model and do what I wanna do conceptually, you know? Floor area faces and volume calculations and surface area and then be able to do like nice wall by face, not end up with pieces of walls that have no really understanding. Anyway, that, that might be an interesting interesting uh, presentation in the future. Hey, I did not know that, this is actually one of those things that probably should be in the, 
what was removed from Revit. I was kind of surprised about this, so I threw this in at the last minute. Um, when you bring in point cloud data, in 2018, you were able to bring in the raw formats, and Revit would kind of, you know, after a while, process them. Um, they're suggesting that you use recap instead. So in 2019, you can bring in RCP and RCS, not the raw, you know, CLL, CLR and the E57 and the FLS, which I think is a good thing, but I'm curious to see if anybody's going to be like, no, why'd you do that for? Nobody care? Anybody care? No? Because you really should be cleaning up your, your point cloud. I've seen nothing but problems with big, large, you know, unregistered point cloud data, so much so that it almost completely destroyed a project. You know, we went into section views and you did zoom extents and the model was over here and the levels were like kind of not really related anymore. It was very troublesome. So anyway, if anybody wants to learn how to use recap, give me a call um, and I'll direct you to somebody. <laughs> now recap is very cool. You can bring in raw point cloud data from any kind of the satellite, so any kind of service, scanning service, bring it in, clean it up, kind of, you know, cut it up into digestible pieces and that would be useful. And it registers them so they all know, you know, where they were acquired from. So, you know, they're all come in geolocated and whatnot. Okay. MEP engineers. I really don't I don't I don't have a lot like I don't know if you remember my one of my presentations was, you know, talking about one of the cool formulas that they use. I don't have any cool formulas this time, but some really good Kind of logical stuff that they did to improve um, pumps and branches and content creation and how you coordinate all this stuff together. One of the big things is the you know the the organization, right? Um, this this part I think is even better because very frequently um, you're creating your pumps and your systems and whatnot and they're really not finished yet, you know, or they're not completely closed, you know. I mean, architects hate it that, you know, we have to load this entire gigantic, you know, model because the system is really huge, right? I mean, it starts from the roof or what have you. So now we could do analytical connections, at least on the piping networks. That means that I can kind of close the systems and they work, even though I'm not really done defining or designing the complete system. Man, nothing come screaming out at you? <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. So yes, the pump sets are, are, are logical and you can define which one is the primary. But I thought that this was really neat, being able to, to kind of do some early stage without having to redesign everything. So kind of like, you know, maybe one day we don't have to cap our ducks if we haven't finished that complete run yet. Anyway. Items removed. Welcome to the Autodesk Revit 2019 What's Not Included presentation. So there's no more Buzzsaw publishing. Buzzsaw isn't dead yet, but I think it's pretty damn close. January of next year, no more. All right, so this was a little surprising. The ADSK format, there seemed to be some problems with it. But, um, you know, the, the main reason for the ADSK site was trying to make uh, Civil 3D and Revit talk together. But the reason why that was necessary is because when I exported a DWG from Civil 3D, it didn't know where it was really. It had a coordinate system, but now it's geolocated. So more, you'll see that feature more and more in 2018 and 2019. Geolocation, it understands where it is in the real world. We still, we still have a 20 minute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now it's gonna know where it is. Now it's going to understand where it is, and we can, un, you know, we can bring that in so it's it relates. Maybe even acquire coordinates from it. I don't know. I'll have to test that out, huh? Yeah, but you know, to have it to have it geolocated is a new feature. Yeah, acquire coordinates is something that's always there, but is it going to be more intelligent as far as where it is in the real world? Anyway, we Steve Costa in our office is a civil 3D dirt guy. I call him. <laughs> so we've been working on various workflows for you know bringing in DWG and civil civil work into Revit. It's not something that we we want to bring in the tin, but we have some pretty cool workflows, um, and this is only going to help. Max, 
you remember the suite workflows? You used to be able to go and say, you know, uh, export or publish suite workflows and send your model to Max. I guess not too many people were using it anyway. I thought it was super cool. Um, but basically, the important aspect is you set up your 3D view, you use the scope box or the section box, and you organize what's visible in that view and you export that to FBX, or you save that view and you name it specifically, and I can open an RVT in Max, which is pretty cool. So I forget actually what it's called, but if I rename a view specific a certain way, Revit uh, in 3D Studio Max will see and bring that in. So that's kind of cool. Communicator, anybody using that with their cloud projects? Yeah, it's not good. There were some security issues. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, it was queued over there in the corner, but it's not necessary. What you really want to be doing is when you're working on a cloud project, or like a collaboration for Revit or a, um, or a BIM 360 design, I think we'll have that discussion in a moment. <laughs> when, you're in the, <laughs> when you're in that world, right, you really should have the team site open anyway. And everything is in the team site. So there's no, no need to have you know, me communicating to the team outside or via Revit. So it was a security breach. It was a hole that Revit was tunneling through to communicate with the team. So we don't have that anymore. I read a project with uh, something where we can control them for any user. And the communicator was telling us which user was thinking. And without that, we would have been just like on top of that, the prediction was ready for 20 users. So mm -hmm. um, frequency users got pumped up while thinking. Mm -hmm. And that tool was the communicator was uh, valuable on finding who is currently hung up on thinking. Hmm. Can I think we're having team think or do I have to wait right. five people? Right, 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 right. Um, without that info, that entire prediction thing is going to be a serious pain. And they, they need to make the work sharing monitor aware of, of all projects. I don't think it will ever. Yeah, I, mean, I, guess the, I guess the security concern is that they hook it up and have anything to replace the functionality of seeing who is thinking. Yeah. There's five people thinking and I'm starting by saying I'm waiting two hours just for nothing. I think I'll open a ticket on that one tomorrow. Yeah. I don't really know. Yeah, I don't really know. That was not in any of the videos that I watched. Definitely not, no. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good question. What I was about to talk about when I kind of segued into the cloud, I want to make sure that everybody understands the differences between um, collaboration for Revit and BIM 360 design. Is that a worthy discussion at this point? Yeah, sure, man. I know it inside and out. I do. So I don't know why I went to my account, but basically when you're dealing with collaboration for Revit, you're, you're assigned a license of a collaboration tool. Like, I guess that's why I went to the account. There's gotta be something here that called design, all right? Max design, alias design, AutoCAD design suite. Really? Billion design, drainage design? I didn't really think that was going to do that. Do I not have a license for? All right, anyway, I might not even have a license. <laughs> but when you have a cloud project, a cloud-enabled project, you're opening Revit, or you're saying file, open, and you're clicking on BIM 360, right? If you're in 2018.2 or earlier, you're only available to use Collaboration for Revit. Collaboration for Revit is the plugin that's in your software. It allows you to communicate with the cloud to sync your model, right? You also are going out to the web and typing in team.bim360.com, right? So when I'm in 2018.2 or earlier, that's all I have. When I'm in 2019, or actually 2018.3 or newer, I can go to one or the other. I guess I don't even have, I don't even have access. Yeah, I was. But what I'm basically saying is 2018.3 or newer, 
you have an option. I could use collaboration for Revit and BIM 360 team, or I could use BIM 360 docs and BIM 360 design. Design is the collaboration component, meaning if I'm in 2019 and I want to open up a, or initiate a project, I go to collaborate, right? I take that file and I collaborate, and it would say, well, what do you want to do? Oh. Let me go here, file, save as, save as project, desktop. All right, save that. So I'm in 2019. Collaborate, hit collaborate, and it says, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to collaborate on the network, or do you want to collaborate in BIM 360 document management? Because I'm in 2019, this is my only choice. This is where I go. I take the project to the new collaboration destination. What that means is I use Revit just like I normally use. I sync with Central, I save, I contribute to the project. But when I want to go to the, to the team site, like you saw me go here, right? Instead of going here, team.bim360.com, I'd go to um, docs dot bin b360.com or whatever it is. <laughs> Hello? There it is. So bin bin360 docs is a document management application. There's all kinds of really cool tools. But what's cool about it, it still holds your project data, right? It still holds your RV your RVTs and it still shows all the versions of that RVT, every published version that you created while you're in the cloud. But you also have one destination for all of these other options, for all of these tools, a la carte tools, insight, field management, project management, right? The project home site, you can create issues and RFIs. But what's nice is that this site, right? Docs.b360.com, order.com. This is on a, a new platform called Forge, completely cross communicating, interoperable between all these tools that you might have. So whether it's you know, your project files, or whether it's all your floor plans, as soon as I put an RVT up here, this system is gonna generate PDFs out of every sheet automatically. So that means that every time I come here and I look at, at all of those PDFs, right, all of these views, they look like they're separate RVTs, but they're not, they're just, you know, they're, they're sheets, they're representations of the sheets. But that means that anybody on the site with an iPad or another device or a laptop, right, Anybody who goes to the site to, to look at what should I be seeing, what should we building, should we be building in this area, right? It's that one source of information. So meaning every time the RVT gets updated, these sheets get regenerated. Not every sig, it's a publish. It's a, you know, I'm, I'm, defining, I'm defining it as a, uh, a version that I'm publishing. Um, not only do we have sync and publish, right, but we also have this opportunity to um, basically define which one is the version that I'm sharing, like which is my issued version. I know it gets complicated and, and we're, we're available to do, you know, advanced demos with all of this stuff, but it gets a little, it gets a little confusing because this is actually something that people wanted to, to see. If I'm, if I'm collaborating with a team and I'm constantly synchronizing everything that I'm doing, they're gonna see stuff that I don't want them to see, stuff where I've disassembled the lobby or I've redesigned this whole wing, right? We don't want to see that. So I create a package and that package is something that that's what I'm gonna share with the rest of the collaborative team that's in BIM 360 design. So right now, every time you hit save at C4R, everybody sees all those changes we're gonna be able to do something different and create a package. Maybe it's every Friday, or maybe it's once a month, or maybe it's at the defined 25%, 50%, 100%. You're gonna decide that. And as I'm looking at these models, you're gonna be able to see a kind of a, a Gantt chart of who's got which version, and have has this team kind of absorbed or consumed the version that I published on this date, or are they still referring to the older version? It's kind of neat. Maybe that's a whole other session. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because you still want to do that for backups. Okay. Let me get all the engineers to actually 
Yeah. Right? I mean, that, that's what it is, right? Yeah. Like, you, you are literally looking into each other's kitchens while you're cooking mm -hmm. and not waiting for the prepared meal, which is what we've been doing for millennia. Right. And you got them all on board, and now you're taking them away again. Well, you could stay there. You could stay on collaboration forever if you wanted. Let me show you what it looks like. So, BIM 360 design uh, package. It's not going to show me, is it? There it is. Is that the one? I don't know what site this is. Could I get a, a worse resolution image? But still, it's kind of cool. So that means I don't have to. They don't have to see everything that I publish. That tells me on the one hand what's available, and on the other hand, who has actually grabbed which version. Right. So I can see who hasn't uploaded as per schedule, and I can see who is not using what's the latest. What did you call it, Harry? Harry Schubert, Microsoft Resources. Thank you very much. But that, is that just a, a, a generic term for that style of chart, or is it an Autodesk term? Generic term. The open doc means you upload a package. Right. Yeah. 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 It's an interesting way to end a Revit. Uh -huh. It enhances, it forces you to communicate better. There's no more, oh, I haven't seen that. Or yeah. It's yeah. more surprises after right. four weeks of seeing nothing. You're surprised by how crappy your engineer model is. <laughs> um, right now, I can see every day how crappy their model is. <laughs> now they're going to hide it. Yeah. And they took it. Well, you know, it's not going to stop them from complying to the BIM execution plan, right? Or your requirement to provide me with something. Well, right now, I can see yeah. every day how far they're behind. Right. So if I see that, I can escalate it to my principal and go to their principal, and then it's a different level. Sure. If it's that moment that I see what I'm getting, it's again shortly before deadline, and it's, I, I don't have the build up. <laughs> Later, you choose. You still get to, but you know, being the the lead on the project, you still get to choose how it how it gets worked on. But it's an option. Anyway, it's a weird way to it's a weird way to end the Revit 2019. What's new presentation? But that is it. All right. Thank you.